up, folks? Welcome back to another episode of the Old Style Angling Podcast. I hope everybody had a good week and a great weekend. It was a beautiful weekend here in Wisconsin and across the Midwest. Uh, Not like last weekend. I don't think we really had a lick of rain anywhere. Not that we couldn't use it in a lot of spots still, but... Um, but it was a great weekend. I know personally I didn't get out fishing a whole lot. I got out Sunday a little bit and uh, did some just fishing fishing, just uh, catching anything out on the Mississippi. And uh, we got into a couple pan fish and I had something big on. Uh, perhaps it was uh, maybe a big walleye or big catfish, but we'll never know because I lost it. So um, just caught, you know, a couple bass, a couple pan fish and just got out and had some fun. And uh, Saturday we were over in Milwaukee, uh, went to the state fair, and then we uh, just stopped by the uh, by the the harbor and the pier and just talked to a couple fishermen, trying to kind of you know scout some areas for uh, the salmon run and try and figure out where they're at right now. Sounds like there's fish staging um, near shore and they're they're moving in, so that's a great sign and. Uh, it gets my blood pumping a little bit thinking about uh, salmon season, and I know I was talking with a couple of my buddies today, trying to get things set up for uh, for planning for that salmon run and and getting on some salmon. It's one of my favorite times of the year, and one of my favorite kinds of fish to target, and just a great time. So looking forward to that. But this week I wanted to talk about what trout eat. Although for a lot of folks, it's not necessarily an absolute uh, necessity I would say to know exactly what kind of forage fish are eating Um, but I know a lot of people um, especially in trout fishing you'll hear them say match the hatch especially in the case of fly fishermen but I know for spinning guys at least personally and uh, among other people I know you can get away with using you know maybe one or two colors of a certain spinner all year round and not really notice a difference in uh, you know oh I was catching them on a on a green spinner way more than a than a silver spinner or whatnot but um, as somebody who you know I have a degree in biology and I I you know have been around the field and um, I find it helpful to kind of combine my knowledge of of fish biology with um, my fishing, although I don't always see um, fishing and biology as something that line up necessarily. I do take a lot from what I've learned biologically and put that into my fishing. So I think it's a helpful thing to know um, no matter what fish you target or um, what style of fishing you, uh, you choose to do. So um, what a trout is going to eat or what they're eating in the water, obviously, like anything else I think I've ever talked about on this podcast, it depends on a lot of factors. And that's something that you'll find with anything. But I'll run through a couple of the major factors that I think impact what trout are eating and how I try to replicate those um, using lures or baits. So first off, I think time of year is probably the biggest factor that causes a change in the feeding habits of, of trout. Now, in the case of larger trout, it's, you know, the opinion of myself, along with uh, some of the papers that I've read from uh, people doing research uh, on these fish, that um, they have a much wider home range than you might suspect, especially during certain times of the year. Especially in uh, larger streams and rivers, uh, the trout, the bigger trout, will tend to travel to the lower, um, deeper, slower reaches of the stream. Uh, generally, I, I would refer to it as the lower um, one-third of a river, uh, so the lower third of the, of the stream or the river. Um, and they'll do this during the colder months of the year when the water temperatures across the stream and across all waterways are going to be more stable and in these lower stretches uh, fish will you know they'll they'll feed on on smaller fish or different warm water species that that will uh, come up into these uh, colder stream uh, environments that would you know if let's say you're fishing on on a stream that dumps into the Mississippi River certain times of the year you'll get a lot of the warm water species you know like walleye or uh, 
smaller um, northern pikes, you know, northern pike, uh, different kinds of species, smallmouth bass that, that you wouldn't think of as stream species, but can uh, create just excellent feeding opportunities for these lar larger trout. Um, because this time of year, obviously, there's not a whole lot of insect activity when it's, you know, 30 degrees out for a high. So um, you're going to have all uh, these larger fish that are um, mainly feeding on, on other fish. So when, you know, in the colder months, when the larger fish are almost entirely feeding on other fish species, I'll use, um, you know, a lure that replicates a small fish, like, a, you know, a medium to large jerk bait, like a husky jerk, or um, if I'm fly fishing, I'll use, you know, longer streamers that just, you know, do a great job of replicating a small fish. And that's going to be really about the majority of what these fish are eating that time of year in the winter. And I won't use spinners as much in the winter, although, you know, obviously they still work. Trout are very opportunistic, and if something comes across their face, they're going to they're gonna eat it. But it's not, it doesn't do a great job of replicating um, something that the fish are actively feeding on. And uh, spinners are a great way to replicate smaller insects, or larger insects rather, and uh, are something that I use more in the summer and the early fall and even late spring. So the fish, I would say, have to be pretty, I would say they'd have to be more active to hit a spinner, especially a larger spinner, than a, um, than a jerk bait or something like that that you can run at a slower at a slower pace than than a uh, spinner although they still work so don't get me wrong i mean you can never really go wrong with throwing a spinner but i think that you know a jerk bait or even you know if you're fly fishing a streamer or a, um or a woolly bugger would work better in the winter i uh, i found a pretty interesting study that that kind of supports uh, some of basically what are my opinions that I'm bringing up here, but I know that um, I always like to find uh, scientific evidence that kind of supports my opinions um, so that, you know, it kind of gives me a justification uh, to my reasoning behind fishing a certain way or uh, a certain spot at a certain time of year. And, um, so this uh, first study that I'm going to bring up was uh, done by some researchers in Michigan on a stream in Michigan. And um, so obviously, you know, anything, everything is going to be different on, on each different stream. So you can never make a, a wide assumption that something will work on every waterway in the Midwest. But I think, you know, in, the, in this case, the, the uh, environments are going to be pretty similar around uh, all around the board. So... Um, you know, I, w I would say this is a safe generalization to make, um, you know, saying a Michigan stream would do a good job of replicating what's happening in the Driftless or uh, in northern Wisconsin. So it's going to be pretty similar all across the board um, when it comes to uh, fish activity in, you know, times of the year. And uh, in this case, they um, found that all but one of the trout that they had tagged and were tracking over the course of a year had moved between the months of August and November to the deeper and slower parts of the river. And um, then they remained in those deeper and slower parts of the river through the following April. So from, say, you know, mid-September to April, these fish were holding in, in deeper and slower water, like the, you know, areas of a stream that are down farther in, in the, um, you know, in the span of the stream. So like I said, the lower one third of the stream. And what they found was in the summer, the um, fish, the sites that the, the fish were using to feed were much more variable. And they really depended a lot on the water temperature, which um, obviously can fluctuate you know, pretty heavily depending on what's happening weather-wise. Um, but like I said, from October through April, these fish stayed in a, in a much smaller area. And that's why I like to fish, um, like to, I like to trout fish a lot during these times of year, um, especially in the spring, 
because uh, we we don't aren't able to fish here in Wisconsin past um, you know mid October on the inland streams. Uh, although I do like to get down to Iowa, which stays open, and uh, fish down there in you know November and late October and the times of year when these fish are you know holding in the deeper spots that they, they aren't moving as much and uh, but they still feed pretty heavily on on you know on lures and baits that look like fish and resemble fish so you know in other times of the year like the summer the fish are going to have a much wider range of of uh, of forage to go after because um, you know, there's all different kinds of things that are that are coming into streams in the summer that you wouldn't have in, in the colder times of the year. Like, for example, you have all kinds of emerging insects that are coming out of their larval stages and, you know, like um, damselflies and uh, mayflies, all the, you know, flies that and all the insects that fly fishermen try to um, try to imitate and that kind of changes depending on where you are in the in the state or in the Midwest and uh, so it's a I think it's a great thing to uh, to kind of while you're out trout fishing in the summer observe what's going on what uh, what's going on around you and you might notice that oh there's you know a lot of this certain kind of insect around here and maybe I should be using a, you know a, a fly that resembles that rather than something that you know they they talk about on a tv show that i watched that you know they're fishing in an entirely different environment so that's a great thing to do and if you're spin fishing something i like to use that replicates a uh, insect really well like i said before is like a, a spinner like a panther martin uh, number six panther martin does a great job of of replicating uh insect a uh, much better job than obviously like a like a jerk bait so I spend a lot more time throwing spinners in the summer um, in comparison to the colder months of the year. So other than insects, which is kind of a, you know, everybody knows that trout eat insects, there's a lot of things that trout eat that you might not think of as a common, uh, you know, forage for a fish. Uh, for example, uh, frogs and mice are something that, you know, exist in, in streams uh, a lot more than you might think, uh, especially like in the in the uh, tadpole stage of a frog's life. I've seen tons of tadpoles in streams, and um, those those are a good forage for uh, trout. But even larger frogs uh, can make a good forage for trout and mice as well. Um, mice are mainly nocturnal, um, and so at night, if you're ever on a stream, you, if you kind of sit there and listen or watch you can see uh, the mice swimming across a, across the stream. And this is something that um, I haven't really been able to find any evidence of, the, of research being done on, you know, what trout are eating, and, because I think it is a really variable thing, and it's hard to, to generalize what they're eating across the board, really, or it doesn't have much relevance, I guess, to researchers. But um, I haven't really been able to find any, you know, papers or anything done on opening up a trout's stomach and looking at what they're eating. But if you look up, you know, uh, trout eating mice, there's all kinds of pictures on, on Google images of, of trout opened up and, you know, there's a mouse in there. And so that's why a lot of fly fishermen especially will try and replicate this by fly fishing at night using a mouse fly, which is an awesome experience. And, um, is it's not for a uh, beginner fly fisherman <laughs> let me tell you it's it's very difficult and it took me uh, quite a while to, to kind of you know uh, adapt my skills to fishing at night without a light um, because you're going to run into some very frustrating times um, throwing you know into the grass and and it, it's just uh, it's a tough thing to do but it's very rewarding because big trout will feed at night in the summer um, pretty heavily in comparison to the daytime. So fly fishing at night is awesome, but like I said, very difficult. And uh, I know if you're living in the Northwoods, uh, something that I've heard people running into at night, fishing at night, is uh, a lot of bears. And luckily, um, where I live, we don't have a ton of bears. You know, they're around, but you'd be pretty, uh, pretty unlucky to run into one, I would say. 
And so I've never had that experience um, fishing around here at night, luckily. So that's one less thing I have to worry about. But it is uh, something I've heard of people encountering up north quite a bit. So uh, that's something to be careful of. But otherwise, um, for spin fishing, this is something I've tried to uh, replicate using um, spinning gear and I've, I haven't had much luck doing it. I've seen some pretty cool handmade uh, mouse baits that I think would work pretty well, but I've tried making some out of uh, poppers, like uh, um, bass poppers, uh, but I haven't had much luck. Another um, common forage that, uh, that you'll see trout feeding on is actually uh, lamprey larva, which uh, so lampreys, uh, in my opinion, are one of the most, one of the least understood um, fish species or just animals in general uh, that that we have here in Wisconsin. Um, so the sea lamprey, which is the one that everybody thinks of, that's the parasite and the invasive species and the, you know, the enemy of, of all Great Lakes fishermen is obviously a huge problem. And um they spend a ton of money um, working on this, you know, problem and trying to resolve it. And, you know, it's a, a t really tough issue and something that is just getting worse and worse. And hopefully they'll find something that, you know, they have all kinds of different methods to um, remove these lampreys. But in the inland waters, we, we don't have sea lampreys or invasive lampreys to worry about. We actually have four native species of lampreys here in Wisconsin. And um, they all, two of the species are parasitic, but two are actually non-parasitic, and they're pretty difficult to distinguish. But um, going back to what I was saying, they they spend a, a hefty chunk of their life in a larval stage, and and they exist in this larval stage in streams, and then they'll uh, mature to adulthood for maybe you know a year or two, and then they move out to a larger body of water like the Mississippi or the Wisconsin River or um, you know a larger river system or lake where they'll you know complete the rest of their lifespan but for the majority of their life uh, they they exist in streams and they exist as something that kind of resembles a, a little leech um, a lot of the species they'll bury themselves in the sand and just stick up their their uh, their little heads and they filter feed and so um, these create a great forage for trout. And I've seen people putting videos on, on Facebook and whatnot of, of just these huge um, schools, I, I, I guess you could say, of, of larval um, lampreys and streams. And obviously, you know, trout are opportunistic, like I said, and they'll take advantage of that. So um, I like to replicate that by using something like a like a leech um, fly um, and this this is one of my best flies one of my favorite flies to use is is you know like a like a leech style fly and um, these trout they they'll prey pretty heavily on these on these lampreys um, in streams they're not very well understood I think because these are these lampreys are are animals that you know exist in an equilibrium in the environment so you know they're not really they're not doing any damage uh, to the ecosystem and and their presence here is something that you know is is entirely natural and uh, so you know when when you see a lamprey on the Mississippi River that's that's not an invasive species that thing is supposed to be here and uh, although they are parasitic which you know you don't want anything hurting the fish they, they don't really um, negatively affect the fish populations to a point where we, they're a concern. You know, it's it's a pretty cool uh, thing that we have all these different species of lamprey here. And, you know, it's it's not something that's very well understood, I don't think, by, by a lot of people. And I, I didn't know about it for a long time. I, I had no idea there was anything other than the sea lamprey. But um, the most important thing here is that these are... Uh, delicacy to trout and so replicating a, a leech style uh, invertebrate or uh, in this case a lamprey is is something that can you know be very can really help your fishing and put a lot more trout on the board for you so um, like I said 
I don't think it's absolutely necessary to completely understand exactly what trout are eating in your um, stream that you're fishing, but just kind of having a just kind of having a, a basic idea of what the different things that uh, that the fish are encountering in a stream, I think is an important thing. And uh, just remembering that, you know, there's more than just uh, insects in a stream that fish eat, and a lot of the larger fish, um, in my opinion don't do a ton of time, uh, don't spend a ton of time feeding on insects. I think they spend a lot more time feeding on things that, you know, would be more, uh, that would be meals that would yield a higher energetic reward to them, like, a, you know, a small fish, uh, like, you know, trout eat a lot of um, smaller trout. They, you know, they cannibalize a lot of the smaller trout in the stream or, you know, sculpins. There's all kinds of small fish that live in streams that we don't see as anglers like sculpins and, and darters and mad toms and all these different little uh, fish species that, that trout will eat. So, um, like I said, trout are opportunistic. They'll eat, you know, anything you put in front of their face. And really when it comes down to it, when you're targeting trout, using a bait that you're comfortable using and, and um, you think you can get into a certain spot and, and a trout can get into their mouth is really the most important thing, but it always helps to kind of understand a little bit about how these fish are, are acting and how they behave. And um, it, it never hurts to understand your environment a little bit better. And I, I think it has personally made me a much better fisherman and uh, I know it'll help you too. So um, just kind of observing your environment while you're out fishing and not being so focused on catching that huge fish will I think help you in the long run and will put more fish in your net. So I hope this uh, was informative. I love talking about trout fishing. It's one of my favorite styles of, of fishing to do. And um, if there's something that uh, I left out here that, you know, um, you think is a uh, is kind of a cool uh, forage that you've seen trout going after drop it in the comments and um, there's always more to learn about fishing and uh, about fish behavior so I hope you guys enjoyed this and I hope you get out and enjoy this uh, this excellent August that we've been having here in Wisconsin and I hope you all have a great week and tight lines everybody thanks for listening